The Saskatchewan Archives is pleased to present this exhibition, the first of a four-part series which focuses on Saskatchewan's participation in the First World War. This first exhibit is titled From the Prairies to the Trenches, Saskatchewan and the First Months of World War I, June 1914 to February 1915. Subsequent exhibitions will be featured on each commemorative year of the war, so we hope you return to visit each new edition of the series. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir presumptive to the throne of Austria-Hungary, along with his wife Sophie, were assassinated in Sarajevo by members of a militant Serbian nationalist group, the Black Hand. Today, the Archduke's assassination is widely regarded as the event that began World War I. Nonetheless, during the summer of 1914, the assassination was seen as a regrettable but largely minor drama from a faraway place, not in of itself worthy of too much notice. In Saskatchewan, over 8,000 kilometres from Sarajevo, while the assassination of the Archduke did make front-page news in a few papers, many did not mention it, and the common consensus was that the crisis would subside over time. Instead, Saskatchewan residents were preoccupied with other issues. Farmers were concerned for their crops, which had suffered from drought the previous three years. Catholics were anxious for the announcement of a new pope after the death of Pius X. And the temperance and suffragette movements were also frequent topics of discussion. As Saskatchewan residents began to labour through a typically hot prairie summer, disturbing events began to unfold across Europe, accelerating like a clockwork machine, marching Europe towards war. A complex network of alliances set many of the great European powers against one another. Germany supported Austria in its grievances against Serbia, while Russia backed its Balkan cousins in the crisis. On July 28, Austria-Hungary issued an ultimatum to Serbia, who in turn relied on its protector Russia to intercede on its behalf. Germany gave Austria its full support, allowing Vienna to proceed as its honour dictated. As the crisis escalated through late July, Canadians, while concerned, were still relatively detached regarding the affair. This sense of isolation did not last. When Germany's initial advance against France violated Belgian neutrality, Britain was compelled to act. On August 3rd, Britain issued an ultimatum to Germany demanding that it withdraw from Belgium territory by midnight that day. On August 4th, when the deadline passed unanswered, Britain declared war on Germany. With Canada being a part of the British Empire, it loyally followed its mother country into war. The community papers across Saskatchewan clearly show the outpouring of patriotic and militaristic fervour at the news of the war. In 1914, many men were eager to serve, seeing the war as a great adventure, a challenge, even as a rite of passage. For every enlistment, there is a different story. Gordon Howard, a farmer from the Weyburn area, recalls the first days after the declaration of war. On August 4, Cleve had gone to town on horseback for the mail or to get chewing tobacco and came home with the news that Germany had invaded Belgium and since England had agreed to protect Belgium's neutrality, England had declared war on Germany. He was most excited and said he was going to town the next day to see about joining up. I replied, If you do, I'm going as well, and to heck with things here. He looked a bit taken aback, so I said, If you wait until we get the crop off, settle things up and find someone to take over the farms, we will both go. Victor Swanston, a farm boy from Meryton, Saskatchewan, enlisted immediately after the war's declaration. His older brother Ernest, a veteran of the Boer War, held off to see if he could join his old cavalry unit, the Strathcona Horse. But as in many things in life, plans have to be changed and solutions improvised. September 8th, 1914, Valcarche. Got a bunch of mail today, and Ern wants to know if there's any chance of getting into a cavalry unit, the Strathconas. Ern's old South African unit are recruiting, but I thought one damn fool was enough in a family. I wrote and told him that there was nothing doing. I knew that he hated walking, and if he couldn't get with some cavalry, he might as well stay at home. 
September 27, 1914. Ern paid his own way down from Regina, and when he got to Quebec, he found that the 5th were on the Lapland, and the only way to get on board was to get out with the mail tug, which called at each ship before she sailed. When he got to the docks and found the tug guarded, he said to the sentry, Say, guy, carry my suitcase on board, will you? I'm about half seasick, and I don't think I can make it across the plank carrying this damn case. Ern had on his South African uniform, and the sentry, thinking he was some delayed officer, saluted and said, Yes, sir, and carried the bag onto the tug. Never even asked Ern for a pass. When Ern got onto the Lapland, he stepped off and stayed off, and got Major Edgar to sign him up with the 5th. A veteran from Moose Jaw, Fred Gillespie, a member of the 46th Battalion, clearly remembers a young friend, Gordon Paul, who had not made final selection for deployment to France, but who could not be deterred from joining his friends. And poor Gordon wasn't picked for the draft. And he wanted so bad to go with his chums. He'd been with them so long that he wanted to continue going with them and be with them. And they wouldn't hear tell of putting them on the draft. He went and pleaded for them to put them on. Nothing doing. But the day we left uh, Ramchot, he was with us on known to the officers. And we got over to the Harve in France when they started calling the road to see if everybody was there. Here was poor Gordon, standing out on the beach all alone. His name wasn't in, even in the books. He wasn't supposed to be there. And they found out what, what his name was and how he got there and why he got there. He said, you know, he just wanted to be with the rest of the boys. And so they kept him there. <laughs> he, was, he was a stretcher bearer. And he was well trained for a Red Cross work. And so that they kept him. Canada's Minister of Militia, Sam Hughes, asked for 25,000 men to fill the ranks. Within days, 33,000 had answered the call. While men across Saskatchewan were enlisting, women were also doing their part to aid the war effort. Elizabeth Patton, a prominent member of Regina Society, became involved in the Provincial Red Cross and was elected to the executive of the Regina branch. The Canadian Red Cross Society was involved in a variety of activities to support the war effort, including the patriotic sale of goods, gathering supplies to be sent to soldiers overseas, and organizing the Belgian Relief Fund. There is no battlefield on earth, nor ever has been, howsoever covered with slain, which has not cost the women of the race more actual bloodshed and anguish to supply than it has cost the men who lie there. The women of all nations, although the first to suffer for man, are the first to aid him through this grand and noble work. On October 3rd, the first contingent of volunteers sailed from Canada for England. For many, it was an almost holiday atmosphere, like an exotic foreign expedition. Over the winter of 1914, the Canadians trained in Britain, and in February 1915, they shipped out for war-torn France. By April of 1915, the Canadians found themselves posted near an oddly named town called Ypres. 